I remember when I was 12, I learned about electrolysis of water through my seventh grade science textbook. Something about it interests me. It said that I can take hydrogen out of water and then I can do what most 12 year olds would do, light it on fire and blow it up. <laughs> so as soon as I got home, I got water, salt, and of course my mom's new favorite Tupperware. And I set up my own electrolysis experiment. But then as soon as I connected the battery, I noticed something weird happened. A yellow gas started coming out the solution. This shouldn't have happened. But then I soon realized that it was chlorine gas, the toxic chlorine gas. <laughs> so I opened up all the windows, turned on the fan, and cleared out the kitchen. When my mom got home and I tried to explain to her that chlorine gas filled the kitchen and that's how to open all the windows, she didn't want to hear it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Luis Parra. I am a junior at the Houston Academy for International Studies, and I am an explorer. And I'm here to talk to you all about basic research. Nice. So, when I was a kid, I liked to take things apart. What I really liked to take apart was my family's VHS player. And at the time, it was one of those huge 20-pound behemoths. So, when I took it apart and I put it back together, and for some reason it didn't work, my mom would yell at me and call for my dad to the rescue. But instead of my dad yelling at me as well and putting it back together, he would sit down with me and talk to me about electronics and teach me how it works. This was my first introduction into STEM. What really got me obsessed over STEM was this book called A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. Something about it intrigued me. I checked it out and as I read on, its complexity made me more and more confused. Except for one thing. It said that when you looked up into the night sky, that image of the stars and the planets you are seeing that is actually millions and even billions of years old, because that light takes years for it to reach the Earth and it hits your eye. So it's pretty much like you're looking into the past. As you can imagine, this blew my little 10-year-old mind away. So it took me a total of two years to finish reading this book, but it's still one of my favorite books to this day. Oops, yeah. <laughs> Let me go next. Uh, my passion was cut short though. My parents being entrepreneurs and investors, they practically groomed me to become a businessman. So I had to hide away my passion to avoid shame. My three sisters went on to become lawyers, realtors, and other business people. But for me, I stayed back with my passion. I love science. And I've always seen myself doing research and becoming a scientist for my whole life. I mean, there's something exciting about research other than me making toxic gas in my kitchen by accident, it's like being an explorer into a new world or frontier because you never know what you're going to find. Because basic research is the study of the fundamental aspects of our world without specific applications. Just think about your new phone. The newest iPhone has this thing called 3D Touch. It uses quantum tunneling to determine how hard you press on your phone. This seems like so advanced and so cutting edge, but the truth is its discovery is over 60 years old. If you see here in this picture, this is the picture of the Dallas Super Collider. Did you know they were going to build the world's largest par particle accelerator in the world 15 years before they built the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva? Congress spent $2 billion digging a hole for it, stopped funding it, and spent another $2 billion filling it back up. The whole reason was because they no longer need to prove their supremacy to the Soviet Union. We all know Newton and Galileo. They were both basic researchers in the sciences of their day. But Newton himself made the fundamental aspects for all classical physics today by simply asking one question. He said, if an apple falls, does the moon also fall? And he simply said this because he saw an apple fall and he looked up and questioned if our moon does the same. But the math of the day wasn't complex enough, so he invented calculus. Now imagine a world without calculus. It doesn't seem too bad, to be honest. <laughs> but a world without calculus is a world without physics. And through his new mathematical method, he was able to calculate that the moon actually falls towards the Earth 1.4 millimeters every second. But the problem was, Newton's basic research was seen as obsolete. No one really had a use for it. So they already just threw it away, and no one paid attention to it. That's how most of basic research is today. People don't really like it. It's not applicable. We really don't use it. Well, I mean, for at least now. And they really don't want to fund it because it doesn't make money. We don't make some product to sell to the public or make some new technology. 
We just try to prove the little things in our world. But the truth is, basic research is so connected to our society. Because without knowing about inertia and momentum, you can't build a car. And without knowing about DNA and its synthesis, you can't cure cancer. And especially in today's world, where we have an influx of engineers, architects, and other people in the STEM world, all these people depend on basic research, the facts and ideas that are proven through it so they can go on and innovate and change our world. Pretty much everybody depends on basic research in one way or another. And for the most part, basic research may not be applicable today or useful today, but it will be needed tomorrow. And this has been proven time and time again. Just look at radio waves. Back when radio waves were discovered back in the 1880s by Heinrich Hertz, everybody deemed them useless. We don't need them. But imagine a world without radio waves, a world where a soldier fighting on D-Day can't send a telecommunication to a sergeant saying, hey, we need backup. A world where we can't send messages over long distances, but we must send letters. You see, because radio waves were the, one of the first ways we sent messages over long distances. We wouldn't be so advanced. We wouldn't be so far ahead. But only through advancements in manipulating radio waves years after its discovery were we able to make use of it. Oops. Yeah. One thing that basic research does is that it connects cultures. When CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, was going to build the Large Hadron Collider, as seen here, they got over 10,000 scientists from 100 different countries to come together and build the world's largest machine. They even got countries like India and Pakistan that are sworn enemies to come together and look over their grudges and emotions to build this magnificent machine. And even the World Wide Web, probably the invention to connect more people than any other invention in history, was made at CERN. It was made so that scientists can talk to each other about the discoveries made there. Research is so intertwined into our technological world, but many don't see it that way. Because research is needed for everything we do, even for the chair you're sitting in or the phone that's in your hand. You see, because as human beings like us, we should push to learn more. Because basic research is like the trunk of a tree where it sprouts off more innovative fields and sprouts off new technologies. So as young people like us, for the most part in this room, <laughs> we should strive to know more. We should strive to question more and go past the obstacles. Because a world where we know, a world where we know more is a future that we can depend on, a future that we share, like our shared future. So my message to you is to, my message to you is to know more, learn more, and maybe research today and knowing more today will help us in the future. Thank you. <laughs>